All right. So this is uh, the module on magnetostatics. We've talked about uh, electrostatics uh, already. Uh, now we're going to talk about static uh, magnetic fields. And this is going to be the last module. As you know, uh, we are towards the end of the semester now. We are just going to have a couple days to cover a couple, two, maybe two and a half lectures to cover some uh, important topics in the magnetostatics area. So I've created a concept map here so that you can uh, get a quick idea of what we're going to be learning and what the, um, you know, why you want to learn, it, like what the applications of some of these technologies are. Uh, today we are going to be talking about the magnetic force, something called the Lorentz force, and uh, you've already know about something called the electric force. The electric force is the, the force on a charged particle due to an electric field. And so this is another type of force that can act on a charged particle. And this is the Lorentz force. And if you take the Lorentz force and the electric force and you sum them together, you get the total electromagnetic force. And this is something that is used, one application of that is ion manipulation in mass spectrometers. This is something that chemists and physicists use to measure the mass of uh, particles that we can't see. Uh, next, we're going to talk about something called the Hall effect, also based on the Lorentz force. And the Hall effect turns out to be very important in uh, magnetic field sensors. So field sensors that are in your iPhones, field sensors that are in uh, commercial instruments and a bunch of different types of motors, for example. Um, a lot of position sensors and things like that uh, rely on the Hall effect. And then uh, we're going to talk about magnetic torque, also originating from the Lorentz force. And that Lorentz force is, uh, the torque is a key element of electric motors. So we'll talk a little bit about um, electric motors in the context of electric vehicles. And then we'll get into like how do you derive torque, um, how torque arises from the Lorentz force and so on. Um, on the next day's lecture, um, and maybe we'll get into some of this today, but I'm guessing we'll probably focus on this today. Uh, we'll, we'll get in, we'll talk about current induced magnetic fields. So if you run current through a wire, you can generate a magnetic field. There are several ways to calculate what the magnetic field is, the Biot Savart law, Gauss's law, Ampere's law, sometimes a combination of these three laws. And um, using these laws, you can start to calculate how much magnetic field if you, you can get if you have current running through a wire, current running through a sheet, and current running in uh, a loop, for example. Um, also, we'll talk about if you have coils of wire, how you can generate magnetic fields, uh, what those magnetic field lines look like in those. Coils are important because they're a central element of electromagnets, which is the next uh, idea here. Electromagnets are used in motors, it's used in industry, it's used for uh, sensors, it's used in a lot of different applications. Electromagnets are magnets that are uh, uh, created, or magnetic fields that are created by running current through a wire. Um, so electromagnets are very different from permanent magnets. So the next section here, we're going to talk uh, briefly about the magnetic properties of materials. Um, what, you know, what makes a material magnetic? Um, you know, we'll talk about magnetic domains, magnetic moments, magne magnetization vectors. And there's three categories of uh, materials, ferromagnetics, diamagnetics, and paramagnetics. We'll talk about how magnetism arises in those materials. Uh, from a usability, from an engineering standpoint, um, a lot of our interest is in this material constant, the magnetic permeability mu, very similar to the um, electrical permittivity epsilon. Right? It's just like epsilon describes the, uh, the ability of an, a material to uh, uh, hold an electric field, so it refers to dielectric materials, that epsilon parameter. Uh, this parameter, mu, refers to the ability of a material to concentrate a magnetic flux. Okay, and a lot of like ferromagnetic materials have high magnetic permeability. Um, if we have time on Tuesday or possibly part of Monday, we'll start talking about inductance. And um, inductances are important because one of the four um, circuit elements is the inductor. You know, you have the resistor, the capacitor, uh, the inductor. And some of you may know there's something called the memristor also. That's the fourth uh, element that was discovered just 20 years ago. Uh, we'll talk about inductive sensors. And then if we have a chance, uh, induction motors. Um, so 
the uh, uh, if you're interested, uh, uh, DC motors are often not used in electric vehicles. Uh, induction motors are used in some of the Tesla vehicles. And then there's something called a permanent magnet motor, um, which we'll talk about, which I actually talk about uh, in this context here. Uh, permanent magnet motors are used in uh, the Model 3s and also the Chevy Bolt. So I think you'll find that kind of interesting. Um, let's start with uh, Maxwell's equations. Um, so Maxwell's equations, as you know, there's the four equations that does a pretty thorough job of describing all electromagnetic phenomena, or most of it. And these, this forms the basis for a lot of um, uh, modern physics that, uh, uh, that have probably get a little bit more appreciation than the, the fundamental Maxwell's equations. That being said, you know, a lot of the electrical engineers, you know, we know that Maxwell's equations are pretty much like Newton's laws of motion to, to mechanics or, you know, the laws of fixed law of diffusion for chemical engineers. You know, it's a very fundamental set of equations. Okay, and these equations actually tell you everything about um, you know, what happens in resistors and capacitors and circuits. It, ha it talks about like wireless communication, it talks about um, you know, electric motors, uh, electric power generators, all the stuff comes from these four laws. So we talked a lot about the first two in the electrostatics chapter. Gauss's law, which is number one. Um, Faraday's law of induction, um, this is number two. Uh, this relates the curl of an electric field to a time-varying magnetic field. Important in power generation and wireless communications. Now, in, in the electrostatics chapter, we set dB dt equal to zero. So um, that's why we didn't get into the induction part. But it turns out induction motors are um, very important. Um, uh, the Faraday's law is very important in induction motors, regenerative braking, and in power generation. So in this uh, chapter, we're going to talk about magnetostatics, uh, the third and fourth equations, Gauss's law for mag magnetism, um, and then Ampere's circuit law. Okay, uh, just to remind everyone that uh, there are four different parameters in these Maxwell's equations. Two of them are related to electric field, and then two of them are related to magnetic field. Um, D is the electric field displacement. Uh, e is the electric field intensity. And we saw that the two of these were related by a parameter called epsilon, the relative dielectric constant of a material. Similarly, in mag magnetics, uh, there are two uh, um, uh, field quantities. One is the magnetic flux density, and the other one is the magnetic field intensity. And they are related uh, together by a proportionality constant called the magnetic permeability, mu. So materials that have a high magnetic permeability will have large magnetic flux density uh, per uh, the amount of magnetic field intensity applied to the material. Analogous to the uh, electric displacement field is proportional to epsilon, the dielectric constant, and the amount of electric field that you apply um, in the material. Okay, so the analogies between the two are, are there. Um, but, you know, we're going to focus on the static equations. So let's look at the static equations. Whenever you're under static equations, Maxwell's equations simplify, and um, all these terms all the ddt terms goes to zero in steady state, right? Because there's no time derivatives. Everything is steady in time. So db dt goes to zero, dd dt uh, goes to zero. And uh, as we talked about in the electrostatics module, what an in interesting thing that happens is that the first two equations um, become related only to electric field. Del dot d equals rho v, del cross E is equal to zero. So these are both electric field quantities, and both and th these two equations below are related to only the magnetic field. In, in the general Maxwell's equations, you can see that this equation relates magnetic field, the change in magnetic field versus time, to the electric field. So magnetic field and electric fields are coupled when you have time-varying fields. Similarly, the fourth ma uh, Maxwell equation, del cross H equals J plus DD DT, this is also relating uh, electric field to magnetic field. But when these time derivatives go to zero, the coupling factor disappears, and you just have two equations, uh, two, two sets of equations, two for electrostatics and two for magnetostatics. All right? 
So since we're only dealing with statics in this chapter, we are basically going to be focusing on these two uh, Maxwell's uh, equations. So what I've talked about here basically summarizes what you see in this table. In the magnetostatics chapter, we're going to be looking at, um, you know, there's no time varying electric fields. Um, you can have steady currents, you know, you can have currents, currents generate magnetic fields, but these currents are steady in time. They do not change with time. Um, and the two quantities we talked about on the last slide, B and H, the units for magnetic flux density is in Tesla and um, the units for magnetic field intensity is in uh, amps per meter or a Henry. Um, so uh, uh, we're able to study magnetic fields on their own without the impact of uh, electric fields at the time being. All right, so some of the intuition of these magnetostatic equations. We have these two equations here. What do they mean? We spent a lot of time in this class talking about vector math. So um, hopefully we have a good intuition of what the curl and the divergence mean. Uh, and so that I want to re remind you of those two things here. Okay. Uh, from our understanding of divergence and curl, um, we can basically make sense of these two Maxwell's equations. Um, so del dot b is equal to zero. That's the conservation of magnetic flux. And the fact that this divergence is saying the divergence of b is equal to zero. So this field is divergence less. The divergence is equal to zero. And what that intuitively means is there's no such thing as magnetic flow sources and flux lines always close upon themselves. I'll show you a picture of this on the next slide. But this means that the fields are divergenceless. You can think, remember, you can think about divergence as uh, the field lines going away, branching away from a certain point, right? A divergent field is where the field lines diverge away from a certain point in space. And this often happens when you have sources or sinks. Um, this type of situation does not happen in uh, magnetostatics. You will not have uh, a divergent field. The divergence is always equal to zero. And so what that means is that um, you will have some combination. For every point in space, you're going to have some combination of vectors that go outwards. You might have some combination of vectors that go outwards, but it will be combined with some vectors that go inwards so that the total divergence at this point is equal to zero. Okay, so again, uh, uh, divergenceless field means that every single point there's some vectors that go away from that point, and also some vectors uh, that go towards it, and the sum of sum of them all is equal to zero. All right, next one is Ampere's law. Del cross H is equal to J, and um, curl. We have to think about what curl means in this case. So the curl of the um, uh, uh, H field, and remember the H field is a magnetic field intensity, the curl of the magnetic field intensity is equal to the current density. All right, so the way that you can think about curl is a rotating field. Okay, so this is telling you that a rotating field, you're going to get a rotating field if you apply some kind of current J. So if there's, let's say the current J is in this direction, there's going to be, that current is going to be accompanied by a rotating magnetic field that, that looks something like this. And we'll get more into this when we talk about the Biot-Savart law. So a current is accompanied by a rotating magnetic field and vice versa. A rotating magnetic field is, um, is accompanied by a current. That's Ampere's law. We're going to get into a lot more details of this, but you just understand the intuition of it right now. So getting more into intuition, like if we think about comparing our electrostatic and our magnetostatic fields, um, we look over on the left side here. Uh, one of the key things about electric fields is that we found that the first Maxwell equation said del dot d is equal to rho v. And what that meant was that the divergence of the electric field the divergence on the electric field given here is equal to the charge density at a particular point. So the divergence of the electric field from a specific point is equal to the charge density at that point. 
And the picture that we can have in our heads is something like this. Imagine that we have a charge that's sitting at some point in space and the divergence of the electric field is equal to how much charge we have at that point in space. So if we have some amount of charge, that means that there's going to be some divergence of the electric field, meaning the electric field lines are going to point outwards from that point in space. Okay. If you have a negative charge, the field lines will be pointed inwards. So it'll look the same except the, the arrows are in the opposite direction. They'll point inwards uh, towards there. So in other words, this Maxwell equation is saying that field lines point away from positive charges, which is a, considered a source, and they flow towards negative charges, or which is a sink. So that's with electric fields. And notice here with magnetic fields, del dot B is equal to zero. All right, you have no divergence of the field. So at every point in space, um, every Mm, every uh, field line which goes away from that point is going to be accompanied by a vector going into that point. And this is nicely shown with this, like a, just a simple bar magnet. The bar magnet, you've probably seen that the magnetic field lines go from north to south like this, and they create this loop. Okay, And that loop is a key element that, that makes the field divergence -less. So that means that any point uh, in Let's say we pick a point right here. So I'll draw this here. Let's say we pick a point right here. So at this point, there are some field lines going up like this, but right below it, there's some field lines going towards that point. So the divergence at that point, which is the sum of the vectors going away plus the vectors going in. So the sum of the two is equal to zero. Similarly, down here, you also have some vectors at the bottom which are pointed going into it, and some vectors at the top which are pointed away from it. So at any point uh, within the magnet, and it turns out at any point even out here, so out here imagine that you have some magnetic field lines going this way, and then you also have some magnetic field lines going out from it that way. So the sum of the vector uh, vectors going into a point, into and out of a point, are equal to zero. So another way to think about this is that it's impossible in, in magnetostatics to have a single source or sink. Right? There's no such thing as just a, a source like this where the field lines are pointing away from it. Okay? Uh, yet another way to think about it is that you can think about in, in, in magnetics, every magnet, every north pole is always account, accompanied by a south pole. Right? If you were to take a magnet like this and say, hey, you know, like I want to, um, if you were to take a magnet like this and say, hey, I only want this, the North Pole, so I'm just going to, I'm just going to cut it like this. If you cut a magnet like that, what you end up with is two magnets like this, North, South. The second magnet would also have a North, South area. You know, and you may remember a lot of these concepts from physics already, but um, I'm just reminding you. Um, so that we understand in this context of what this del dot b equals zero, what it means. Okay, uh, the magnetic field lines always form a loop going from north to south. So they go away from the north and then towards the south. Okay, one point of that that sometimes confuses students, and I want to clarify that by showing this image here. Um, students often think, well, in electric fields, you can also have loops, can't you? Uh, you think about what a dipole looks like, right? Like you think about a dipole as a con uh, combination of positive and negative charge. And you see the field lines kind of looping around like this, okay? All right, so you can see some of the loops here. So I will, I'll say that it's true that you can have loops of, um, uh, uh, you can have uh, electric field lines that look like loops, but it's not truly a loop. In order to have a loop, you have to have a circle go and, and the field lines have to go in the direction either clockwise around that circle or counterclockwise around that circle. If in this loop, what you see here is that the, the field lines goes clockwise. But if you want to complete the loop, if you want to go up like this, now um, this portion of the loop, the vectors are pointed counterclockwise. So you can't go around a loop like this 
you know, this part is for, uh, going clockwise, and the rest of this part is, uh, the part of the middle is counterclockwise. So you don't truly have a loop. Uh, in the magnetic field, if you look at a bar magnet, which is north and south, um, the magnetic field lines go down like this, clockwise, and then as it's going up, it's also going clockwise. Okay, so that's the subtle difference between an electric dipole, which has a source and a sink, and a bar magnet, which has a north and a south pole. They look like they might be similar at first glance, but they're actually not, due to the fundamental differences between the electric uh, electrostatics and magnetostatics. Um, any questions? Any questions or just give me a thumbs up if, if you're following fine. All right, great. Good. Okay. Uh, here's another table comparing electrostatic and magnetostatic fields. Um, in electrostatics, the sources are stationary charges and they create um, a divergent field. In magnetostatics, your quote-unquote source is a steady current, and that steady current uh, produces a rotating magnetic field, a loop of a magnetic field, okay? You don't have divergent field in magnetostatics, as we just said. Uh, fields and fluxes, you have E and D in electrostatics, H and B in magnetostatics. Um, in electrostatics, we talked about the dielectric constant, or the relative permittivity, and we also talked about the conductivity. This one applied mainly to dielectric materials, saying that if you put a voltage across a material, how strong will the electric field be? And this one was saying, if you put a voltage across a material, how much current will you get? So this applies to conductive materials, the second parameter, which is sigma, the conductivity. And magnetostatics, we only deal with a single parameter called the magnetic permeability. And we'll talk a little bit about that more when we get into um, the magnetic properties of materials. Uh, governing equations, we just talked about this. Um, first two you're uh, aware of already. Um, these are the differential forms of the equations. Um, uh, just to recap here, uh, we, the divergence we talked about extensively, but these two, if you compare these two uh, in electrostatics, del cross E is zero. So the curl of the electric field is zero. Electric fields cannot form loops, as we just showed on the previous slide. Um, in the case of magnetic fields, del cross H, which is the curl of the magnetic field, is equal to J. So it's saying you can create a rotating magnetic field by just having a current. You cannot create a rotating electric field in electrostatics. These are the differential forms. The integral forms um, are found by just taking the differential forms and integrating both sides of the equation. Um, this was, uh, you recall, is called Gauss's law, the integral form. You integrate both sides of these equations. Um, when you have the integral of uh, del dot d, you do a volume integral of that. That's equal to this, uh, a surface integral by the, um, by the divergence theorem. So we're not going over that now in the interest of time. But you, you're able, um, you've got a Q on this side and the, the surface integral of the electric field on a closed surface on the left side. Similarly, um, in the case of the magnetic field, um, Gauss's law for magnetism states that B dot ds is equal to, the uh, integral of B dot ds on a closed surface is equal to zero. So you know how we have had those tricks of applying Gauss's law in electrostatics? It turns out that we will be able to apply tricks like that to magnetostatics as well. Um, uh, this was a rule by, found by uh, integrating del cross E equal to zero. Um, you use the uh, um, uh, Stokes theorem in this case, and you can, uh, when you integrate this over an area, you can then use Stokes theorem to come up with this uh, form of the equation. Um, e dot dl, integrative E dot dl over a closed contour is equal to zero. In the case of magnetostatics, we're going to find that the integral of h dot dl over a closed contour is equal to i. This is called Ampere's law, and we're going to be using that uh, in, this, uh, in this module. Um, this is probably one of the things we're not going to get to this semester, uh, but uh, the scalar potential V, we talked about this already, the, the, the equivalent of that, or the analogy of that, the magnetic potential is um, 
is, is something called uh, A, you know, the vector magnetic potential. And we are not going to uh, get to that probably this term. But there is an analogous uh, uh, thing to the scalar potential in the magnetostatic domain. Um, in a capacitor, the energy density uh, in a capacitor is equal to 1 half epsilon e squared. Um, this, this describes the energy storage in a capacitor. In the magnetic domain, the analogy is the energy storage in an inductor. So you can have, uh, just like you can store um, uh, static energy in a capacitor using charge, in an inductor, you can store energy in the form of a magnetic field. Okay, so this is related to capacitors. This is related to inductors. In, uh, in the force domain, and this uh, segues nicely into uh, what we're going to talk about next, is the forces. In the electrical static, electrostatic domain, we have the electrical force. F is equal to E times Q. Um, that is the force that drives current through a circuit. That's also called, it's called drift current when you have these charges are moving. But the force exerted by an electric field on a charged particle is equal to Fe. That's the electric force. In the magnetic domain, it turns out that you can get magnetic forces that, that act on a particle, but that particle has to be moving. A non-moving particle will not experience any magnetic force, and that's a key difference when we start talking about the Lorentz force. So this Fm, the magnetic force, is called the Lorentz force, and we're going to talk about that next. It results from a magnetic field and a charge that is moving, not a, not a static charge. All right, so let's um, let's get right to it then. So now we're going to talk about the Lorentz force. So this is a very fundamental uh, force in um, in the magnetic domain, and it's extremely important because it's used, as I said before, it's it's used in um, many different application areas. The Lorentz force is uh, used for ion manipulation in scientific instruments. Uh, the Lorentz force is responsible for the Hall effect that is used in a variety of magnetic field sensors. And importantly, the Lorentz force is the basis for um, uh, DC motors. And uh, though we're not talking about it in this module, it, also, it is also the basis for um, uh, in, inductive turbines for generating power, uh, induction motors, and, and things like that. So the Lorentz force is an extremely fun, uh, important and fundamental uh, force in um, Electromagnetics. Um, a quick show of hands. How many of you have heard about the Lorentz force before from a physics class? Oh, good. Good. Okay, I see a lot of you are familiar with it. And if not, that's okay. We're going to go over it now. <clears throat> so the Lorentz force is a magnetic um, is a force that's exerted by a magnetic field on a moving charge. As I said, that charge has to be moving. The force is called the Lorentz force. is given by this equation. The Lorentz force is equal to Q. This is the amount of charge. U cross B. U is the velocity of the particle. So I'm just going to note this here. Um, velocity, and this is given in meters per second. Okay. And this is the magnetic field. And the magnetic field is given in Tesla. Okay. Um, now, um, <clears throat> so this is giving it in terms of a cross product. So what this is saying is that if you have a charge that is moving, so the charge, if the charge is not moving, u is going to be equal to zero, and the force will basically be equal to zero. So the charged particle uh, has a charge q, and it has to be moving at a velocity v. So let me indicate this here. This is the charge on the particle. And the unit for this, of course, is coulombs. Charged particle moving at a velocity u. 
and you also have this magnetic field, the total force acting on that particle is going to be equal to Q U cross B, so the, the cross product between U and B. Now, if you remember from uh, uh, when we talked about vector math, there's a very simple definition for the cross product, and that definition is um, that the cross product of A, um, the cross product of A times B is equal to the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times sine of the angle between uh, sine of theta AB. So the sine of the angle between the two vectors. Okay, this is just a general definition of the dot product, and um, so the cross product. And so we're just applying that here. So Q, magnitude of U, magnitude of B, sine of theta going from U to B. The direction of velocity, the, dire the direction that the particle is moving, and the magnetic field. Okay, and the resultant vector is pointed in the n hat direction. And this is really important because I, I can guarantee you will have a question like this in your homeworks and probably on the exam, asking you to figure out what the direction of that Lorentz force is. So, right hand rule. Um, the right-hand rule is a little bit different than the one that we did before. This right-hand rule, you can uh, picture your fingers like this. So um, the, the cross product of A cross B, your first finger, the index finger, points in the direction of the first vector A. The middle finger points in the direction of the second vector B. And then your thumb points in the direction of the cross product A cross B. So this is your n hat. It's pointed in this direction. All right, so if you apply that to the, this uh, Lorentz force, your index finger is going to be in the direction that the positive charge is moving. Okay, assume a positive charge for now. Uh, the, the positive charge is moving in this direction, and uh, your, your, um, your middle finger is pointed in the direction of the magnetic field. Uh, just a little bit of notation here. Uh, cross indicates into the page. And then if you have a field, if the direction of your field is like that, this is pointing out of the page. So across like this means the direction of the vector is into the, into the screen, and the dot means this is coming out of the screen right at your face. All right, so um, imagine that you're just, everyone can try this, you know, point your index finger up upwards, point your middle finger into the screen, and then your thumb is going to point to the left, and that is the direction of the force applied to that, um, uh, applied to that uh, charged particle. All right, so, um, so just to bring your attention over to this side here, so if we apply the right hand rule there, you can, you know, try this with your, try this with your hands. Imagine that you have a positively charged particle, and the magnetic field is moving in the upwards direction, the charged particle is moving from left to right. So you can just do the right hand rule there. Your thumb, uh, your finger will point from left to right. Um, your middle finger will be pointed in the upwards direction, and then your thumb will be uh, pointed in the direction of this force. Okay, so as the charged particle is moving through this magnetic field, it's going to experience a force in the right-hand direction. And because of that, the trajectory of the particle will, will get curved like this. It will end up going in, uh, in this uh, direction. And it turns out that if, you, if, you, if the particle has a lot of velocity and it keeps on going, it will actually start to just go around in a circle like this. right? Because whatever direction the particle happens to be going, it's always going to experience a force that is 90 degrees away from it. Regardless of what direction is going, what direction it's going, the force is always going to be 90 degrees. So it's constantly going to be turning. It's like you were driving, it's like as if you were driving a car and it's, the steering wheel is permanently turned to the right. It's just going to keep on going. All right, now, um, the important part of this image here is to show you that the negatively charged particles will experience a force in the opposite direction. So if you have a negatively charged particle traveling at a velocity u, um, remember that the charge on a negatively charged particle is, is, is negative, so it's opposite polarity. As a result of that, the force 
is also going to have an opposite polarity. So what I like to do is like I like to first think about this as a charge, uh, a positively charged particle. Figure out the direction of the Lorentz force. So I would figure out that the Lorentz force is in, you know, the force on oops, the force on a positively charged particle. Call it Fp would be in this direction, and then the force on the negatively charged particle is in the opposite direction. So that's how I you know mentally think about that. So that I can still use the right hand rule. Okay. First, use the right-hand rule to figure out the force on a positively charged particle, and then I just negate, you know, I go in the opposite direction. And so the force will be in, in this direction, um, and, you know, if I were to let this particle go on forever, you know, it would also, you know, go in this uh, a rotating pattern there. Okay, um, any questions? All right. So a quick uh, example on the Lorentz force, an electron is moving at a speed of 10 to the 6 meters per second in the y direction. The magnetic field has a strength of 1 tesla as oriented in the z direction. What is the magnitude and direction of the Lorentz force on the particle? All right, just remind yourself, you know, x, y, z, that's our Cartesian axis, Cartesian coordinate system. So I'm going to put out this polling question, and there's... Um, five choices here yep and I would like you to indicate what is the direction of the force an electron is moving at a speed of 10 to the 6 meters per second the electron has a negative charge it's moving in the y direction the magnetic field is in the z direction uh, for right now let's just figure out the direction of the Lorentz force and then uh, the solution here will show the the magnitude of it Okay, we're going to wait for four or five more people. Okay, great. So I'll share the polling results with you. Uh, so 48% of the class, 10 of you said B. And then uh, the remainder of the class was split evenly between A, C, D, and E. So the force, uh, let's go through this. Let's think about what, what the direction of the force is going to be. It's an electron. So let's, uh, what, when you have negatively charged particles, my suggestion, here, let me pu I'll publish the polling results real quick. Okay. Um, so you think about your index finger. So the electron is oh shoot. Okay. Electron is traveling in this direction. So you have your index finger pointed in the y direction. Uh, the magnetic field is pointing in the z direction. So your middle finger is pointed up in the z direction. And then your thumb is going to point in the x direction. Okay. However, this is a negatively charged particle. So your thumb is going to point in the direction opposite of the Lorentz force. So the actual Lorentz force is going to be in the negative x hat direction, not the, not the positive x hat direction. OK, um, any, any questions on that? Because it seems like uh, many of you had put B instead of C. Okay, Abdullah is typing. Just wait a second. Negative charge means opposite direction, correct. 
Correct. So whenever you have negative charges, apply your right-hand rule, assuming it's a positive charge, and then just flip the direction after, after you apply the right-hand rule, figure out the direction. Does that make sense? Okay, great, great. Thank you. Thank you for your question. All right, now uh, figuring out the, uh, uh, the actual magnitude of it. And for that, we can just, uh, um, I don't think I, yeah, let me just move this away here. So the magnetic force is equal to Q mu cross B, magnitude of mu, magnitude of B, sine of theta mu B, and uh, this is in the n hat uh, direction. All right, so um, the, uh, yeah, let me just draw this out here. I mean, this is pretty straightforward, but I just want to make sure that everybody's clear on this. X, Y, and Z. So your electron is moving in this direction. So your U is pointed in the positive X hat direction. So your U is in this direction. Uh, your B is um, your B is pointing in this direction. So the sign, uh, the angle between the two, this is a 90 degree angle between the two. So your sine of theta AB is equal to 90. So you have sine of 90 here. Um, your U was uh, 10 to the 6 meters per second. Your B is 1 Tesla. And then your charge is negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. So this is where you get your, you know, mathematically, this is where you get your negative x hat, right? Sine of 90 just comes out to 1. This is 1 multiplied by 10 to the negative 6. Uh, here's your x hat because your n, um, this is the direction that you found from the right-hand rule. The vector that's perpendicular to both b and u by the right-hand rule is x hat direction. This negative sign comes from the fact that your charge is negative. Okay? So the magnitude is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 13 newtons of force being applied in the negative x hat direction. All right. So the total electromagnetic force is, um, is equal to the electric force plus the magnetic force. So in last chapter, we found out that the electric force is equal to F equals EQ. And the, in the Lorentz force, we found out that the, um, uh, the, the magnetic force we just found out is equal to Q U cross B. The total electromagnetic force is just equal to the sum of the two. Electric force plus the magnetic force, Q uh, times the electric field plus Q U cross B. And, and both of these terms have a Q in it, so you just take the Q out and you're left with Q times the electric field plus u cross b. So there's two components, right? There's the the electric force component and the Lorentz force component. And depending on what type of situation you're, you're in, one might be stronger than the other. Um, and, you know, you can think of a few different examples of that. Let's say you just have, um, you know, let's say you just have a resistive element here and you have a voltage source here. You know, you get your electric field, you get your uh, charges moving through here. All right, if you have, uh, um, giving the example of a uh, conductive material here, if you have a positive charge in that material that experiences an electric force and it moves through the material. There's an electric force and that electric force causes that charged particle to move through the material. Um, but now if you have a magnetic field on top of that, that, that uh, charge can de get deflected. So I'm going to show us a quick example here. And then I'm going to show a more detailed example of how the electric force and the Lorentz force are used in something called a Hall sensor, which is a magnetic field sensor. All right, so I'm showing you just a, a simple example here is let's say we are now applying a voltage here across this material. So this is a, let's say this is a resistive material. All right, 
so. Make this positive and make this negative. And let's just consider positive charges right now. So you'll have a positive charge that looks like this. Okay, when you apply a voltage, you're going to get an electric field that goes in this direction. And your charged particle is just going to travel through the material like this. That is due to the electric force. But let's also say now if you have a magnetic uh, field on there, let's say your magnetic field is pointing in this direction, now it turns out that particle will actually have an electric force that's pushing it this way, but then you're also going to have a magnetic force that's pushing it this way. So there's two forces acting on the, um, uh, on the charged particle, Fe and Fm, and that causes that particle to take take a curved trajectory like this, okay? Because there's both elements in there. So let's get into the details of that because this is a very interesting effect that can actually be used as a field sensor. Um, actually, hold on. Before we get to that, we'll talk about the application of the Lorentz force in, in mass spectrometers. All right, so mass spectrometry is used for this, uh, the separation and quantification of multiple ions uh, simultaneously. And the magnetic sector mass spectrometer relies on something called the Lorentz force, as, as you just learned. Um, so what you're doing here, um, this is a, uh, um, a source of ion beams. So the ions go through like this, and they're traveling at a certain velocity v. So the ions are traveling at a certain velocity v, and um, then they go through this magnet, okay, a magnet that's sort of aligned like this. Um, it's, it's an arc, a 90 degree arc. And as a result of that magnet, the particles will actually travel um, uh, in, in different trajectories. So I'm going to, here we go. So if we think about this as in terms of a, a Lorentz force, okay, you can think about a charged particle. Let's just assume that these have positive charges. Okay, so the direction of the velocity is in this direction. So that's our U. And then the direction of the magnet. Okay, think about the direction of the magnet here. If you, if you want, think about it this way. If you want the charged particles to travel this curve, um, what direction should the magnet be? What should be the direction of the magnetic field? So just try your right-hand rule like this. If you want the charged particles to curve over to the right, what should be the direction of the magnetic field? Okay, I'm not getting I'm not getting any answers here, so I'll just I'll just say real quick it should be in the uh, in the upwards direction. So it should come out of the page like this. Okay, think about your index finger pointed from left to right, your middle finger pointed out of the screen, and your thumb will point in the direction of the force. And so your Lorentz force will be pointed in this direction, so your magnetic force. And so that, uh, uh, here we go, that charged particle will then travel this uh, trajectory like this. Okay. So uh, the reason why th this type of thing turns out to be useful is because the Lorentz force is applying a, a force that's deflecting the particle, but these particles also have a, um, a, a momentum. Okay. So the momentum wants to keep the particle traveling in the forward direction and not get turned as much, whereas the Lorentz force is seeking to turn the particles. So the question that I get asked, the, the a polling question, which detector does the smallest uh, particle, meaning the smallest m over z, where does that go to? So m over z is the mass divided by the charge of the particle. So just think about that for a second and um, select a, b, or c.
Okay, just give another um, another 10 15 seconds or so. All right. Yeah, so I see most of you put put A. Um, A A is the correct answer. All right. So um, the the light particles get deflected more by the field. The uh, um, the inertia of the particle. The inertia of the particle wants to keep it going in a straight line, and then the Lorentz force wants to make it turn to the right. So the, the heavier particles, the ones that have more inertia, will go straight like this, and they'll get deflected less. They'll go to the outer ones. The ones that have a smaller mass and have less inertia will go to uh, these. So um, the, the reason we say m over z, uh, that the chemists say m over z, is because um, it turns out that it's actually not just determined by the mass, but also the charge. The, just like I said, the, 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 um, the mass of the particle means it has more inertia, so it wants to go in a straight line. But the higher the z is, the higher the charge is, the more the Lorentz force is going to be. So things that have low m over z will go in the straight line, and the ones that have, I'm sorry, things that have a high m over z will go in a straight line because they have a lot of mass and very little charge, so less Lorentz force. Things that have low m over z are light particles that have a lot of charge, and those ones will get um, impacted more, deflected more by the Lorentz force. Okay, so if you have a series of detectors at the bottom like this that can detect the ions coming in, you could have a mixture of ions like this, like uh, um, ions from the air, and actually determine the composition of the air by, um, by, uh, 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 by using this device. So chemists use this all the time because, like, uh, you know, in analytical chemistry, you're often given this unknown um, material, this unknown chemical, and you want to try to figure out what's in that thing. And um, it turns out that the science of mass spectrometry can actually uh, allow you to very accurately find out those types of things. There's a lot of electrostatics involved in that, which is pretty, pretty neat. All right, so let's go on now and talk about the Hall effect. Um, just ignore everything on the right side here, and I want to just walk you through this uh, step by step how the Hall effect sensor works. Okay, you'll have all this stuff on the right for your reference here, but just follow this on the right hand side right now. Um, so, what is a Hall effect? The Hall effect is, is uh, an effect that causes a voltage to form on a semiconductor device in the presence of a magnetic field. So this is used in a bunch of sensors that are in your cell phones and, and vehicles and industry and things like that. It, they're very, very common types of sensors that can detect magnetic fields. So let's just um, show this from the beginning. Let's say you want to detect a magnetic field in, um, that happens to be in the vertical direction. Okay, It doesn't have to be in the vertical direction, but let's just, let's just say for starters that this is what we're doing. Um, so we have a piece of semiconductor here, and that semiconductor is shown in green. And the first thing we do is that we apply a voltage to it, just like I showed you on the previous slide. Uh, a positive voltage on the top, a negative voltage on the bottom. So there's an electric field that forms in the material, and we're going to call that EV, the electric field due to the voltage source. All right, and this is uh, the electric field is obviously going to result in a force on the charged particle. So let's say we have a charged particle that is injected from the circuit. So you have positive charges flowing through here. And you also have negative charges flowing through here um, that, that can go through the semiconductor material. In a semiconductor material, there's holes and electrons. So let, let's just deal with the holes first. The holes are, think about them as positively charged particles. The holes will experience... A, a total electromagnetic force that is composed of two components. The first component is the electrical force. So we can call that force, the electric force E, due to the voltage, so FEV. And so the, the velocity of the hole due to this force is going to be in, in the same direction, so UEV. 
right now with the, the um, but once a particle starts moving once it starts moving it's going to have a velocity u and so now it's going also going to be subjected to the to the Lorentz force the magnetic field is pointing in the upwards direction as you saw earlier and so if you apply your right hand rule here you will see that if your index finger points down your uh, middle finger points up your thumb is going to point in the direction of the magnetic force the magnetic force is going to be pointed in the right hand direction all right so as this particle uh, moves through the device it's going to move downwards and but it's also going to be deflected off in this direction so just watch this animation of it and you'll see what the particle will do particle move through the device but it'll be deflected off to the right so again you can watch it again it has uh, electric force in the downwards direction magnetic force off to the left so it gets deflected moves through the device and it gets deflected off to the right as it moves through all right now when you have when you have like uh, um, you know tons and tons of holes that are uh, positive charges that are moving through the device in the same manner you're going to end up building a net positive charge on this side because the holes all deflect off on that side so you end up building a positive charge on the left side of your semiconductor now similarly in a, in a typical semiconductor you have electrons and holes you have two types of charge carriers so the electrons, they move in a direction opposite the electric field. So the electric field is pointing from top to bottom. The electrons move opposite the field. And so uh, your electric force and the velocity of the electrons due to that voltage source is pointed in the upwards direction. Again, we have the magnetic field pointing in the upwards direction. And if we do apply our right-hand rule here, we'll find that you can do this yourself and prove to yourself that the magnetic force is now pointed in the right-hand direction. So as this electron travels through the device, it's going to go upwards, but it's also going to be deflected off to the right. So just follow the electron through its path now. All right. When you have a bunch of electrons that follow that same sort of deflection, you end up building up negative charge on the right-hand side of your device. All right. Now think back to the electrostatics chapter. Whenever you have a set of positive charges, and then you have a set of negative charges, you have a voltage, an electric field and a voltage that forms between the two. All right, so um, electric field lines point from positive charge to negative charge. So you get this EH, this is the electric field due to the Hall effect. So this buildup of charge on either side of the device is called the Hall effect. So you have these electric field lines that are everywhere on the device. I just drew it here, but the, you can imagine these electric field lines are everywhere going from left to right throughout the device. This effect happens almost instantaneously. It happens almost immediately. I showed you like what's happening in super, super slow motion, but this happens almost instantaneously. Um, now, what happens when this field actually builds up? Um, now, again, let's... Uh, uh, assume you have your charged particle, but now you have this electric field due to the voltage source, same as before, and now you also have this electric field due to the Hall effect. So, uh, and then you also have the Lorentz force. So now, interestingly, what you're gonna find is that you have the same um, uh, electromagnetic force, the Lorentz force that you had before, but now you have this additional electric force in the opposite direction okay so let's go through the three forces this is uh, this is a force electric force due to the voltage source that's going to push the hole in the downwards direction the u goes in the downwards direction and then uh, your Lorentz force due to the magnetic field and the velocity is pointed from right to left same as before but now we also have this electric field due to the Hall effect and that uh, that electric field is going to push the hole in the opposite direction. So it turns out that once equilibrium is established in the Hall effect sensor, this magnetic force Fm is equal to this electric force Feh. So these two forces are balanced and the hole travels through the device straight like this. It does not get deflected anymore once this electric field is established. Similarly, for the electrons, you know, you have those three forces the same as before, but now you also have 
uh, this electric field due to the Hall effect, and the electric field is pointing from left to right, and so the electron experiences the force going from right to left. And the FEH and FM are balanced, and the electric field goes in the forward direction like this. Okay, so um, that in a nutshell is the, um, is the Hall effect. And what's beautiful about this uh, device is that these, uh, this piece of semiconductor can be extremely small, just a few, you know, hundreds of microns or a few millimeters. Um, and so you can create a magnetic field sensor with just a little tiny piece of um, a semiconductor material. And it's a very effective uh, magnetic field sensor. All right. So um, based on our understanding here, I'm going to back up here and just, um, you know, bring out this uh, uh, picture of the charge here. And uh, using this analysis, we can uh, derive the Hall voltage. So the first thing we would do on this particle is say that the Lorentz force Fm is equal to the charge times the velocity of the charge times the magnetic field. Okay. Uh, this, is, this is a simplified form of the equation, assuming that the velocity and the magnetic field are orthogonal to each other, right? That u cross b will just become uh, u times b, the magnitude of u, magnitude of b, if they happen to be in the 90 degree direction. Uh, finding the current is the next step. So the current, as we uh, know from the last module, i is equal to the, the uh, current density times a. And in a semiconductor device, the current density is equal to the charge density N, uh, the, the concentration of carriers N multiplied by the, the uh, charge of the carrier Q uh, multiplied by the mobility uh, of, of the material uh, times uh, A. I'm sorry, this, is not, this, this should be mobility times electric field here. Let me add that in there. mobility times the electric field there. Okay, now you can put the Lorentz force in terms of, um, in terms of I. Uh, so the Fm is equal to Q over I divided by N times Q times A, uh, and then you end up getting the, uh, times B, and so their magnetic field is now equal to I times B over Na. So what we did here is we put the Lorentz force in terms of the current which is uh, much more convenient. Okay. Um, now the last step is you balance the Lorentz and the electrical force. So that's the part here. The intuition here is that this magnetic force on the, going from right to left is equal to this Hall effect electric force going from left to right. So this should be FEH. If we want to be very specific here, FEH. You set those two equal to each other, um, and you know that the uh, electric force is equal to um, electric force is equal to E times Q, and E, the electric field, is equal to V divided by W. W is the width of the device here. Okay. And A, as you saw before, is a cr cross-sectional area of the device. So I'll just be very explicit here and say this is A. That's the cross-sectional area of the device. <clears throat> so I times B over NA is equal to VH times Q uh, divided by um, W. So the Hall voltage times Q over the width of the device. So you solve for VH and you get IB over NQD. Extremely simple equation, linear equation describing the voltage that you can measure. So what you would do is, in a Hall effect, what you would do is just, um, let me just move up, move to the end here. The way that you'd use a Hall effect sensor is that you'd apply a voltage here to run a current through the device. And then you have, a, a, um, you also have electrodes on the left and right side so that you can measure this Hall voltage, VH. Okay. And that Hall voltage is linearly proportional to the magnetic field. All right. It's a nice, uh, simple equation. 
Now, if the, if the magnetic field is not orthogonal to the plane of the device, then you're going to have the sine term here, right? You'll have the, um, you know, the, cr uh, the cross product will have that sinusoidal term, uh, a sine of the angle between them, all right? So Hall effect sensors, this is how they work. This is a picture of it from Hyperphysics. This, this website, Hyperphysics, has a really nice description of Hall effect. So here are the different uh, applications of Hall effect sensors. Um, the one that you're probably most familiar with, if you ever pick up your, you could pick up your phone, you know, pull up Google Maps, and you'll see that um, uh, that if you pull up a map, it shows a direction that your phone is pointing. You know, it has that little shadow here like this. If you ever wonder where that comes from, that actually comes from uh, a compass, a digital compass that's in your smartphone. Your smartphones have little Hall effect sensors in them that can sense the Earth's magnetic field. And so that way when you turn your, you know, you turn your phone in either direction, um, your, um, your maps actually has a sense for what direction uh, it's going. So that's probably a very um, uh, popular application of uh, Hall effect sensors. And this, this actually has a little, nice little description of the magnetometers in your smartphones. Um, a more industrial use is in hard disks, maybe DVD players, any, any type of situation where you're trying to detect rotation. So a very simple way to detect rotation in, with the Hall effect sensor is assume that you have some kind of disk, okay, like a, a computer hard disk. And so if you just put a small magnet on one side of the disk or some part of the disk that's rotating, and then you have a Hall effect sensor right next to it, this Hall effect sensor can sense these changes in the magnetic field. Okay, so um, your signal over time, well, let me just, I think I have um, uh, a diagram that shows that. So this is what a, a, a sensor might look like with a motor. So let's say this is the motor that's turning your hard disk. Okay, the actual motors don't actually look like this, but let's just say that's the case. Um, attached to the motor, you can have a little uh, rotating permanent magnet like this that has alternating north and south poles like this and just put your Hall effect sensor there. So as this magnetic, as this motor rotates, the magnetic field direction changes, and then your Hall effect sensor is gonna give you a Hall voltage. You know, so you measure your VH, the Hall voltage on this side, and that Hall voltage is gonna change as the motor is rotating and, and you get this north and south poles like passing by the Hall sensor like that. So as a result, you'll actually see, um, you'll often see like a sinusoidal wave like this, of the Hall voltage versus time. So let's say this is T and this is the Hall voltage VH. You'll see that the, um, the, the magnetic field increases uh, sinusoidally and then it decreases and then it just goes up and down like this. And by measuring the frequency of this, you can actually measure the speed of rotation. And it turns out this is really important um, in feedback systems. Is let's say you have a motor that you want it to be spinning at a, at a very uh, precise speed. Let's say you're in a car and you want that, or let's say you're in a hard disk, you want that disk to be spinning at 7,000 RPM so that you can read data from it. Uh, you, your Hall effect sensor will make sure that the disk is spinning at the, at the speed that you wish. You have like some kind of feedback system that controls it. Another type of um, a similar type uh, approach that you can use to measure speed is uh, you have this uh, a fin made up of a magnetic permeability material. Um, it's called a reluctor. And you have a, um, a permanent magnet on uh, one side and a Hall effect sensor on the other side. So when, as this thing turns, when you have this high permeability material in between the magnet and the Hall sensor, the magnetic field lines will go through this material and reach the Hall effect sensor. Okay, the, you can think about high permeability materials as ways to transmit a magnetic field. Um, when, as this thing rotates, when, when, um, when there's not a, uh, this reluctance material in between, when it's just air, the permeability in between these two materials is going to be less, and so there, the magnetic field detected in your Hall sensor is going to be less. And so that's another way that you can um, uh, detect rotation using uh, Hall effect sensors. Um, okay, just give that one second here. Um, so uh, these wheel, uh, these types of speed sensors I mentioned, they're used in, um, uh, they're used for not just hard disks, but also in automotive type applications, um, anti-lock brake systems, all-wheel drive systems. They have wheel speed sensors 
on each one of the four wheels. And they have, um, you know, a little Hall effect sensor that, that can be used, or sometimes they use proximity sensors, but Hall effect sensors are used quite frequently. Um, they have this permanent magnet that's kind of rotating around like this, and you can measure the electric field, or measure the magnetic field, and measure the speed of rotation. And as many of you know, um, you know, these anti-lock brake systems and all-wheel drive systems, what they do is they sense the speed of the different wheels and if they sense that a certain wheel is rotating too fast, um, for example, if you start skidding, your, your vehicle goes over a, um, a puddle and that wheel happens to start spinning, then the anti-lock brake systems will actually start pumping the brakes to make sure that you don't, uh, that you don't uh, you know, glide, that you don't lock up your brakes. The all-wheel drive system will actually supply less power to that wheel so that, again, that, so that that wheel doesn't start spinning uncontrollably and you lose control of your vehicle. So these speed sensors actually play a very important role in, in automotive safety. Um, you know, how, how a sensor like this might actually look in a, in a vehicle is that you might have like a, in your wheel, you might have um, uh, some kind of rotor that's attached to your wheel and it has uh, these, um, a high reluctance material on here and um, this high reluctance material like rotates past a Hall effect sensor and as they're rotating by the, the magnet it changes the magnetic field at the Hall effect sensor because there's a permanent magnet through here and it changes the the reluctance of the magnetic system the magnetic circuit and so your magnetic field changes over time how much it changes doesn't really matter that much it's the question the thing that these sensors are trying to measure is how fast the magnetic field is sensing it's trying to sense the frequency of the sinusoidal wave, not the amplitude. The amplitude is not all that important. You're just trying to measure how fast the wheel is spinning. Okay, so it's a little bit about Hall effect sensors. Um, now the Lorentz force, you can talk about the Lorentz force in the segment of current carrying wire. And this is, becomes important in electric motors. And that's the last topic that I want to cover today. Um, so um, the question we want to answer, the fundamental question here, is that if we have a segment of current carrying wire and you place that in a magnetic field, what is the Lorentz force on that particle and how does it deflect it? So we can just do a quick, um, you know, I'd like for you all to do this, just uh, take, uh, uh, you know, take a second and apply the Lorentz force using the right-hand rule. So imagine that we have a current Okay, and the current is going upwards like this. All right, so in this one is showing the current going upwards. All right, now, so your index finger is pointed from bottom to top. It's pointing in the Z direction. All right, so pointing from bottom to top. Your, your middle finger is now pointing into the screen. Whenever you have X's here, these little X's in the circles, that means you're pointing into the screen. Um, and so your middle finger is pointing in that direction, and your thumb is now going to point from right to left. So the charges, you know, if you happen to have a straight wire like this, and you had charges flowing through a straight wire like this, the, the charges would have a Lorentz force that would cause the charges to move in, in this direction. All right, so your magnetic force is in this direction, and that would cause the wire to deflect off to the right like this. So it would just deflect like this. If the current happens to be traveling in the opposite direction, now your wire is going to deflect off in this direction. So this is obviously an example of where you have a flexible wire. Right? The wire can flex easily. In motors, it turns out that it's rigid and it actually causes the wire to move. That's the basis of electric motors. Um, so the question we want to answer here is what is the force on the wire? And um, uh, this comes from the Lorentz force. So uh, let's just look at this for a second. So the, the, the Lorentz force is Fm is equal to Qu cross B. And now what we're doing is we're saying the differential force, dFm, the differential force is equal to the differential charge in a segment of wire. And we still have our U cross B here. So this is a differential form of the Lorentz force equation. Um, so... You take the idea is you have a small segment of wire, okay, like this. Tiny segment of wire, and that charge, that segment of wire has a charge uh, dQ. Okay. 
that segment of wire has a charge uh, dq contained in it. And these charges are moving at a velocity u, and there's a magnetic field b. So the amount of charge in this little segment is equal to Ne, which is the concentration. This is the concentration. The elect ah, sorry about that. Electron concentration. So electron concentration is given in one per meter cubed. The number of electrons you have per meter cubed in the material. This is the charge of an electron. 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Actually, we're talking about uh, we're talking about uh, positive charges moving here. So that E just represents this constant 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Um, and you have a cross-sectional area A and uh, and a DL. DL is the length of this wire here. DL. So this gives you the total amount of charge in this little segment. You multiply that, this by u, the direction that the charges are moving, cross it with the magnetic field, um, and you have this dl quantity here. This dl quantity, we're going to put the direction of uh, the current, and we're going to make this a vector. So, you have, um, so this everything in here, these three terms combined with this u term, becomes the current. And that's the big simplification here. Concentration times the amount of charge times the cross-sectional area times um, the velocity. That is equal to the current. Okay, if you don't believe me, you can prove that to yourself by uh, going through the similar derivations as we did in the uh, electrostatics chapter. I times dl cross with b is equal to the incremental force on just this segment of wire. And if you want to find the force on the entire wire, then um, you have to integrate uh, this. So this is the rule that you want to remember. Uh, the total magnetic force on a wire is equal to the current in the wire times the integral of dl cross b. And so let me just show you a quick example of how to use that, a very simple example. So let's say we have this, um, have this wire here. So I'm just going to erase this so you can easily see. So the force on this, we want to calculate the total force on this wire here. So we say force, magnetic force, is equal to I, the integral of dL cross B. So our dL in this case, you can just write that down here, dL is equal to we're moving in the in the z direction going from bottom to top. So this is going to be equal to dz times z hat. And our magnetic field is equal to um, b0. So that's the mag magnitude of the magnetic field. And this is going to be in the, um, the x, uh, the negative x hat direction. It's pointing into the page x is coming out this way, so the magnetic field is going into the page, so it's pointing in the negative x hat direction. So you got i, and our dl is equal to dz, so that tells us that we are going to be integrating according to z. We'll do z equals 0, and imagine that this is the length of the wire, 0 to l of um, d hat dz crossed with um, b0 negative x hat. Okay, and um, this just becomes equal to um, integral from z equals 0 to l um, so this is going to be the negative y hat direction so and then you multiply that by the magnitude of the dl vector, which is dz, and the magnitude of this, b0, and then the uh, sine of the angle between the two. So this sine just becomes, uh, this goes to 1, because the angle between them is 90 degrees. 
And if you integrate dz from 0 to L, um, you're left with the direction is in the negative y hat direction. And it's equal to i times b0 times L. It's quite a simple formula there. The force is in the negative y direction, and the magnitude of the force is equal to i times b0 times L. All right, so in the last uh, 10 minutes here, I'll show you my co I might go a little bit over. I apologize in advance. I want to finish covering this for today. Um, so I think you'll find this kind of interesting, is that electric motors are actually based on the uh, Lorentz force. So uh, as I was looking at this over the weekend, I thought that a little bit of this trivia you might find uh, kind of interesting on, um, on electric vehicles. So as you see here, this is the, the Tesla Model X, and over here is the, the Chevy Bolt. Um, both of them use um, electric motors, obviously. And uh, this is what the drivetrain looks like on a Tesla Model X. There's a front drivetrain and a rear drivetrain. You can see that the, the front drivetrain has a large, larger electric motor, and then the rear one has a smaller one. So you actually have two motors in these cars. Um, but what makes electric motors unique compared to internal combustion motors that are in you know, most of the vehicles today is that they can produce a lot of torque. Right? In fact, they, and, and they produce the most torque uh, when the vehicle is standing still, when there's no velocity in the motor, when there's no rotation rate in the motor. As a result, um, these uh, motors actually have have the ability to um, beat out a lot of the sports cars in drag races. And drag races is where you start from zero and you see how fast the car can get up to 60, uh, 60 miles per hour. Um, I, I didn't have the specs on, on this, so I forgot to write this down, but the 2020 Lamborghini Aventador um, has a torque rating of 690 newtons per meter, and I believe that um, that the zero to 60 miles per hour was like around three seconds, if I remember correctly, uh, roughly three seconds to get from zero to 60, which is pretty crazy. And this is a V12 internal combustion engine, a very powerful and gas guzzling uh, engine. Um, the torque is 690 newtons per meter. Uh, the Tesla Model S um, puts out an insane amount of torque that's like uh, 1373 uh, newtons per meter. Um, so almost like 40% more than the Lamborghini. As a result of that, if you were to drag race them off the, you know, uh, drag race the two, uh, the Tesla Model S would get to 60 miles per hour much faster in about 2.4 seconds, where I believe the Lamborghini was a little bit, maybe around the three second uh, range. It's just because electric motors have a lot more torque than um, uh, gasoline motors. And, uh, you know, you've probably seen these, but there's a plenty of YouTube videos where you have a, a Model X even. Even Model Xs can, can beat out Lamborghinis. You'll see like a, a family SUV right next to a Lamborghini and then <laughs> it's quite humorous. So you can, you can watch, uh, watch them at your convenience. And it's simply because electric motors put out a lot more torque at zero RPM. Now, if you were to continue the race, gasoline engines actually put out more torque at high RPM. So eventually a gasoline engine powered car would um, eventually uh, win a longer race, but off the, you know, um, off, off the strip in a drag race, the electric cars actually do better. Now, um, the, uh, the Model 3s and the Chevy Bolts, uh, these are geared more towards the, uh, maybe a little bit less performance, um, but more in the cost-effective range. Um, these also have pretty, pretty good performance, I would say, using internal um, magnet motors. Uh, the Tesla Model S and Model X use an induction motor. We won't be talking about that in this class because we don't get to the, the dynamics portion of it. But these ones use synchronous motors that are based on um, permanent magnets. Um, and we can understand that in the context of electromagnetics. Um, we will be able to understand that in the context of electromagnets when we get to the electromagnetic section. Um, these also put out uh, lots of torque. Um, you still get like really good um, acceleration times in both of these cases. Um, the reason they switched over to these internal uh, permanent magnet motors is because of uh, cost. Uh, it reduces the cost of these uh, types of vehicles, but they still have really good performance. Um, so what I wanna do is talk about torque 
and um, oh boy, we're just at three minutes left in class. Okay. Um, I, I don't think that we'll have a chance to go through all of these today, so um, it's probably best to uh, end end the class here and and um, not overwhelm you guys with too much material. So what we'll do in next class is we will talk about uh, uh, torque, the concepts of torque. We'll talk about uh, torque in um, in a current loop, and then uh, we'll talk about uh, a torque in a current loop in a slightly more complex geometry, and then we'll eventually we'll get into uh, uh, DC motors. So you can see an application of what the Lorentz force is. The Lorentz force essentially causes um, a DC, a basic DC motor to turn like this. We'll talk about a few different types of DC motors. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about synchronous motors um, once we start talking about electromagnets. And so that'll be a nice um, application of some of these basic concepts that you're learning, how they might apply to um, electric vehicles and other types of electric motors. Um, so we'll end here today and uh, uh, next time in class we'll get also talk about how do you calculate the magnetic field from, uh, from a current carrying wire. Uh, so let's see here. So today we talked about the total electromagnetic force, the Hall effect, and we just got into magnetic torque, but we'll finish this up next time. And then uh, in Wednesday's class, we'll talk about current induced magnetic fields. And, um, you know, if we get if we get a chance, we'll, we'll hopefully get into some of the magnetic properties of materials and then inductance will probably may not get to it uh, by Monday. We'll see. We'll see. I'm not going to overload you all with material right at the end of the semester. Okay, so let's uh, let me just check to see if there are any questions. Um, just a minute. There you go. All right, so no questions right now. Um, uh, if, if you have any questions, feel free to ask right now. And otherwise, we'll get into the, um, the office hours portion. Okay, so I, I don't see any questions. Great. Okay, I will then, um, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop the recording here. My local recording.